Welcome to Music Ed Tech Talk, a podcast exploring music, education, technology, and the intersections between them, with a special focus on the productive and the creative process. I'm your host, Robbie Burns. Hi, it's me again. I'm going to do another solo episode this week for a couple of reasons. The first reason is similar to what I said last episode, which is that, you know, I spent the better part of the month of February preparing for a return to a hybrid learning model in my school and also preparing a few Music Educators Association conference presentations. And so what I thought I would do is double down on all that work I did and make another episode based on one of those presentations. So last episode was called Rehearse Your Ensembles Remotely. It was based on a presentation I did at the Maryland Music Educators Conference last month. This one will be similar. I'm going to do an audio version of Develop Performance Skills Remotely with Cloud Software, which I presented at the Texas Music Educators Conference, which I'm presenting at the NAFME Eastern Conference later this spring, and which has you know proven to be a pretty relevant and popular topic this school year. This one is a little different because unlike last week, I had already made a digital video for this topic. In other words, I took my TMEA presentation and I threw it on YouTube. So the way that I made this episode that you're about to hear is I took the transcript of that video and then I tried to take out as many things as I could that referred specifically to what I was showing on the screen. I'll admit to you, it's not perfect. There's a couple of awkward moments where you're going to know you're listening to the transcript of a video. If at any point you feel like you want to watch that video, I have included a link to it in the show notes to this episode. The cool thing about this episode is that while I developed a lot of these assignments and strategies as a result of teaching online, all of them have fantastic potential for an in-person learning model. In fact, I'm really looking forward to refocusing my instruction on rehearsing a large ensemble, but then having a lot of these kinds of cloud-based assignments and projects happening at home to create more diversity of instruction and more engagement at home rather than my students just hearing from me go okay now go practice the music well now they're going to have tons of more structure and engagement to how they are doing that okay before i run the presentation here's a couple of other housekeeping things i want to mention it's been about a year since i started doing about two episodes a month and this also was the result of a move to an online learning model. I had lots more free time. I knew that teachers needed not just technology support, but certain kinds of technology topics to be covered. So I've been trying to produce a lot of content. I've been trying to get people on the show who are going to specifically talk with me about things that are working in virtual teaching environments. But I realized that at this point in the school year, not only are we starting to see a light at the end of the tunnel, but you are probably not really taking in lots of new ideas at this point in the school year. In fact, probably for months now, you have been exhausted <laughs> on this subject. So that's, that's how I feel, at least anyway. So I'm not like revamping majorly anything I'm doing in the classroom between now and the end of the year. I'm always checking out new technology, but there will always be a time and a place for that. So what I think I'm going to do is I've got some great guests lined up for the rest of this month and next month. And then I think around the end of May into early June, what I'm going to do is just do some fun episode topics, things that certainly have to do with music, technology, and education, but that are a little bit more loosely structured based on just general things I'm interested in. Like I'm going to do an episode on smart assistants and smart speakers, like you know Siri, Google, Alexa, what are their strengths and weaknesses? How do they operate in a smart home? Which smart speakers work best with each of those respective assistants? And how do you build a smart home speaker system? Uh, I'm going to talk about gadgets that I like. I have lots of hardware. I'm looking at it on my desk. I realize I've never talked about it on this show. I'm going to talk about other things I love too. I'm going to talk about music I've been listening to. I'm going to talk about new apps I've been trying this year that just haven't really fit into other episodes. I'm going to keep things generally light and fun. And uh, hopefully that will keep things a little bit lighter over the months of June and then July. And then as we start to see what teaching is looking like next fall, then I'm going to reassess how COVID-centric I want the topics to be. But I'll return to a little bit more of a normal thing then. And now I'm going to hit the play button and you will listen to my Texas Music Educators Association conference presentation titled Develop Performance Skills Remotely with Cloud Software. I hope you enjoy it. My wheelhouse for technology is a little bit more on personal productivity, music producing apps like score editors and 
digital audio workstations. And I'm really familiar with the Mac OS and iOS app ecosystem, a lot of the third party apps. And I try to use those to their fullest potential to make myself a teacher who's better able to organize themselves and then make and produce content that's relevant for student practice, student engagement, and all of that. It's not until my school system went online last March that I really started to explore the options that are student facing. And I'm talking about things that are where students are creating and performing themselves into the software. And then the software is giving me some degree of flexibility for how I grade and provide feedback for them. So we're going to talk a little bit about what is cloud software. Well, to me, cloud software is kind of like a buzzword in the technology industry. What cloud software really means when I hear it, at least to me, is that you're running a, a piece of software that runs in a web browser. So the whole platform is built off of server infrastructure. You know, it's running on some computer elsewhere and then you're interacting with it. Your window to it is through a web browser. Uh, so I'm talking about things like Smart Music, Note Flight, Music First, Soundtrap, Band Lab. A lot of these products are web first. Some of them do have apps that you can use to interact with the software, but the dominant interaction model is through a tab in your web browser where you're doing all of the lifting from there. So this would be like uh, a contrast to something like what we would call native software or apps, something you would download on the app store of whatever platform you use and actually install to the device. Now I use native apps whenever I can because they run uh, smoother. They typically have more powerful features. Uh, they don't require a, an internet connection. There's a handful of, of reasons why I, in any case I can, can try to do my work in native applications that are actually installed to my mobile or my computing device, whatever it might be. The reason why cloud software has taken off with students is because stuff that runs in a web browser is really easy to integrate into other services. So for example, we're going to talk a little bit about integrating some of the software today into an LMS. Mine in my district is Canvas. These are um, so prevalent in education is because they're cross-platform. Any major computing platform, whether it's iOS, Android, Windows, Mac OS, it's going to have the ability to install a web browser on it. And if you have a web browser, then you can interact with pretty much any cloud or web-based software, which means that in cases like right now, where lots of students are working online and have been handed Chromebooks, they can use really whatever is available to them and it's gonna have access to this software. My attitude coming into this fall was when my county purchased some of this software for our district, I wanted to ask myself questions of like, how do I keep this experience as true as possible to the nature of why students want to play, in my case, band instruments, and try to honor that interest and have them doing that as much as possible. And then using this technology where it fits, not just like forcing it upon my students in ways that either isn't relevant to our instructional goals or that demotivates them. And I also wanted to be conscious though of like, what are the limitations? Like what are the things that they are not going to get that they would normally get? And are there ways and opportunities to explore new things like composition, for example? So these technology tools provide new avenues, but they also provide in some cases supports for doing things, in, you know, the traditional way. So for me in my synchronous classroom environment, we are in Google Meet and I am having my students play as much as possible because that's what we would do in band. Now they're on mute for a fair deal of that time and they're playing along to a lot of play along tracks that I have made using Logic Pro and other great software. And I'm occasionally having some of them either individually or in small groups unmute so that I can check things like notes, I can check things like tone, posture. I'm fortunate that my students are, you know, for the most part on camera when I'm teaching. But there's a whole lot of things I can't assess in that model meaningfully. And so this is where some of the cloud software enters. So I want to talk about them in order of where I see them in the process. Because to me, the strength of Note Flight is that what I'm doing is I'm using it uh, in combination with the new Soundcheck add-on, which enables Note Flight scores to grade the pitch and rhythm accuracy of student performances. And then I want to talk a little bit about Soundtrap, where it, that is the place where I'm having students collaborate the most, do the most things creatively, and then record 
performances of themselves into for a grade. Uh, and then I want to talk about Flipgrid because Flipgrid is sort of like I'm using for a variety of things, but it's more of a like final submission. It's like after these other technologies have been used to provide feedback and engagement to students, Flipgrid is the place where it's like, okay, just send me here as you playing your part of say, like if we're, it's a concert band piece that I'm going to edit into a virtual video, like you're recording your part into it. And Flipgrid is just the tool that you're using to do that. So it's a, it's sort of like a, a final step, but also I use Flipgrid for other things too. So we'll, we'll hopefully get into all of that. And we're going to start with NoteFlight. Now, what I love about NoteFlight is that it is a composition tool and was, you know, this is, this is how many people conceive of it. But what they don't know is that NoteFlight is also now a learning management tool. The library of music that is available to you as a subscriber can now be assigned and organized in a sequence of instructional-based pieces of music to a performing group. So... Uh, you can use it as a tool that will assign music to students for to perform. And then what happened over this past summer is a new feature was added called Soundcheck. And Soundcheck is a way that you can, it's sort of like, I won't call it a mode, you, co you copy, you create a copy of one of your NoteFlight scores, and then that version of the score becomes performable to a student in a way in which they not only record themselves into their computer, but then it analyzes their pitch and rhythm accuracy. So I want to talk a little bit about what are some of the strengths of NoteFlight, like what are the things I use it for. It's not perfect. None of these tools are. So you use them for the ways that they're going to work for you and your students, and then you don't, don't try to make it work in ways that it's not going to work for you or your students. So for me, the sound check piece is dominantly where I'm spending my time. I've experimented a little bit with composition, but I feel strongest when I'm using NoteFlight as a way to do almost like mini checkoff points for performance skills. So things like scales, things like short melodies where we're talking a little bit about pitch, rhythm exercises, things where the very nature of it recording them and looking at the accuracy of pitch and rhythm is sort of like a first step towards them getting deeper and richer feedback. We don't want those things to be in the way when I'm in an environment where I can give them feedback on more important things like tone production and posture and intonation. So we want this to sort of be an automated part of the process. You don't automate giving meaningful feedback to kids. It's not a realistic thing, but you can automate telling them is the right finger pushed down. And that's sort of where this enters into the picture. So see here, my note flight score library is uh, a hot mess. I've got lots of untitled scores I really should delete. So we'll look here, we've got a scale exercise in the key of F major. I made this scale exercise that moves in thirds. And then because I made this in note flight, I just, to make it a sound check, I go to the score details and then I click here and then I click create sound check score and then it takes some time to convert it. And then what you eventually end up with is a, du a duplicate copy of that score in your library, which has this, the icon becomes a disc with two eighth notes instead of a single eighth note. And you'll see it looks different. The interface doesn't have the option to you know play with any of the notation because it's meant to just be performed by a student. So you'll see here, a student can play this. <laughs> All right, they can isolate their part. They're actually going to have to do this because on the student end of this, you have to first isolate your part and then click the record button. They can change the tempo, which is awesome, like because it allows them to record things much, much more slowly, which is like when they're playing along to a metronome, it's really easy for them to be frustrated and see how bad their timing is but then also because of the nature of you know this can be they can try this as many times as you allow them to they can just like do it again do it again do it again do it again and it's sort of like doing the assignment has the practicing built in so i mean it's we know that the nature of students is the practice habits are not always consistent what's crazy and awesome about these tools where they have to perform their instrument into a computer to get credit is now all of a sudden like there's no way they can skate by without actually taking the instrument out of the case and we know that transitioning to practice is the hardest part. So once they're actually in this and doing it, I'm finding that many of them will try it again and again and again and again until they get it right. And it might not, it might not be the most effective kind of practice that we encourage, but it is repetitive and has a goal in mind. So I appreciate that as well as the fact that they can slow it down if they need to and regulate that without me telling them, slow down. 
You can do a handful of other things, just some common pitfalls that you're gonna wanna know if you're using this tool. I always have them use the metronome. You, you notice here that in the um, recording options, if you turn on the metronome, the follow me option turns off. Follow me is if they play, it'll like, the play bar will wait for them to play the note. But I'm teaching middle school. If they're on, a trumpet player is on a wrong partial or if someone's playing the wrong note, it's just gonna like freeze there and confuse them a lot. Like why won't it move forward? Well, you played a wrong note or it can't even register. Your tone quality is so uncharacteristic that it's not even registering a pitch and allowing you to assess the next note. So always have them turn the metronome on in these settings. It will give them a score every time they record. I'm gonna sing this as it should be, and it's gonna correct, it's gonna give me some feedback based on that. So here we go. Two, here I go, now here's the scale. All right, so 87 out of 90. So it is, what it is doing here is giving me how much did I play of it? Well, how was my pitch? How was my rhythm? And then I can retry it, assuming that you, the teacher, have allowed them to retry it. This, I was, my pitch was steady enough that it showed a steady line, but there's a little bit of kind of like a swoopy, slopey motion, which shows uh, a little bit more information about intonation. So like extreme dips in my voice are depicted like as a little drop. And what I often do is this will be the first step towards uh, something that is an ensemble or a larger group piece as well. So I'm not just doing these like small checkoffs, I'm also saying like, hey, we're going to record this piece. Uh, it's like a flute trio, and there's going to be three of you working on this project together. Well, before we move to Soundtrap, which would be my tool of choice for that, we will oftentimes just make sure that the notes and the rhythms are solid by using Note Flight. Like I said before, there are lots of ways you can get things into Note Flight. For me, I often link some of these shorter form assignments to a Canvas assignment, I don't want to talk too much about Canvas because not everyone uses Canvas, but you'll see here, this is an example of my learning management system. And I have all of these tools, Note Flight, Soundtrap, and Flipgrid integrated so that I'm able to have certain assignments in Canvas link out to those applications as the preferred tool. And then when the student submits the work, it saves it right into Canvas so that when I'm grading, I can just like page through the different results which is really, really useful. Canvas uses something called a speed grader where it's like, okay, let's say that note flight is the tool that we used. Well, I'll see one person's assignment and then I'll grade it. By the way, note flight with sound check will automatically put the score as the Canvas grade. But if for any reason you wanna override it or provide some student feedback, you can do that in the speed grader. So once I'm done grading one student, I click a next button and then it just pops over to the next note flight example from the next student in my Canvas gradebook. It's really, really useful. I can do it on my iPad from the couch, which is handy. But because these apps are only authenticated through the Canvas connection, this was all handled by our school district. So it might be a little different for you. I had to create a module in Canvas called external tools where I like put a direct link to each of these apps in case, just in case for any reason they wanted to go into Noteflight or Soundtrap and just make some beats or compose or just explore the library. They needed a way to be able to get to these apps. So this is the way that they get there. The other way they would do it is by me actually creating an assignment. So let's go ahead and create a new assignment. And that assignment is going to be called F major scale. I'll give some instructions here. And then the way that Canvas and many other learning management systems work with third-party tools like NoteFlight, Flipgrid, and Soundtrap is for the submission type, you would usually have an area where you choose it. And if it's integrated by your school district, you'll just choose, in my case, NoteFlight... And then when you create the assignment, we'll make that due Friday, it will prompt you to choose which specific note flight thing that you want to be attached to the assignment. So right now, it's just, I didn't do that. So it's just showing me my scores area. But if I want the students to see a specific thing, I would go to my scores and then I would choose in this case, the sound, the sound check enabled version of my F major scale, and then click this big orange button to attach it to page. That's how most of the third party programs work. Soundtrap is really similar. You, it kind of shows you the Soundtrap interface 
over top canvas and allows you to kind of look through all of your different projects and templates and choose the one you want and then attach specifically that one. So a kid who's going through canvas, while well, their other classes might be giving them work that they complete directly in canvas. But then when they see this assignment, they get a little button that links them directly out to this page in NoteFlight and then saves it right back into my gradebook in Canvas so that no one is ever really getting the feeling like they're leaving Canvas. Canvas is sort of like the starting and the ending point for all of the work. All right, so I was just about to talk about how I get things into NoteFlight. Well, how I get things into NoteFlight is I either, when I'm going through that process of linking the NoteFlight assignment to the Canvas page, if it's something as short as an F major scale, sometimes, I'll actually just compose it all in the same process of setting up the Canvas assignment. So I'll say Canvas assignment, set up F major scale, link it to NoteFlight, open up NoteFlight. And then before I click that orange attach button, I will literally just say create new, compose the thing, and then click the orange button. Because when you're linking an, a third party tool to your LMS, you can pretty much interact with that tool in its entirety within your LMS. So you can like, like in my case, I'll just sometimes compose a short thing and then link it all within the same, all within the same step. But you could see before that all my score library was available to me when I was doing that canvas link. So it's fine if you have made it in advance. I do a lot of making work in advance by going to create and then I import XML files. An XML file is a type of file. It's, it's basically a file type that is able to communicate musical notation across different scoring editors. So like Finale, Sibelius, Dorico, MuseScore, NoteFlight, all will export or import an XML file. You cannot really expect them to all behave the same as one another because there are different standards for how XML is executed. In my experience, doing stuff like these basic scale exercises and, and sometimes concert music, I'm not really running into issues because the needs of the notation are so minimal. Things like simple note values, not a whole lot of extended techniques, basic dynamics, key signature, time signature, you get the idea. Uh, I do want to show you kind of a roundabout way that this happens because, you know, music comes from all places. It might be on a piece of paper. Maybe you were able to snag a couple of resources from your school before the quarantine started if you're an online if you're working online or maybe you're you are in school and you have access to paper music that's in your library there's some tools that are worth recognizing since i know that not all music starts in a digital form and now i just need to give the copyright speech before i say this i recognize that fair use is a thing there's a whole lot of reasons you would want to take something that has copyright and purpose it in a way that you could do something with it instructionally i'm not making any statements about what you should or should not do with your music resources by scanning them into a computer, embedding them into documents that you show on a screen for an online class. I'm not making any statements about that. I'm just telling you, you need to do your research, be aware of what the laws are and what are your goals in instruction. Because what I'm going to show you right now, there are, you will immediately imagine how it could be used illegally. But I think it's worth talking about some of the utilities that are available to us. So I'm going to show you, um, this is an example. So I'm basically trying to find out how to go through as many tools as I'm aware of to get music into a form. So let's say that you have a piece of paper on your desk. You can use a tool like Scanner Pro or ScanBot to scan that directly into a mobile device. It'll trim the edges. It'll make it grayscale. So it's going to look as close to as if you actually made the file in Sibelius or Dorico on your computer and then exported it to PDF. I've gone an extreme route with this before. Like there's a whole lot of resources that are available on Kindle now. And I've done this thing where I buy a thing on a Kindle and then I screenshot the material that I need. And then I use PDF converter to convert those because all those images went to my camera roll. So I take them out of the camera roll, convert them to a PDF, and then I open them inside of this app, Sheet Music Scanner. Now, let's say that you can easily go from straight to paper using this Sheet Music Scanner app. And there's I'll, in the notes to this section, I'll leave a couple of other competitors to Sheet Music Scanner. There's a whole lot of apps that'll do what I'm about to do. None of them work really well. I like Sheet Music Scanner because it is only $5 and because it works the best in my experience, even though it doesn't do triplets, which is a shame, but it is what it is, I guess. And what Sheet Music Scanner will do is 
this is not the same as the scan I showed earlier. It's not going to turn it into a PDF. It's actually going to turn it into an XML where the notes can be played back, transposed, edited, and then exported into a program like NoteFlight. Now, sometimes you're going to find that there's weird, funky XML issues that you need to work out in a program like Dorico first. But eventually, once you get them clean and you're happy with them, they go into NoteFlight. And this is kind of where Soundtrap gets into the mix here, because Soundtrap is, like I said, sometimes a secondary layer of a bigger picture. So let's say that I've assigned my students to play a trio. And the trio is out of a method book they use. It's called the Six Note Blues. Let's imagine that they've done some kind of check assignment where some of the notes of that have been assessed in a, in a note flight sound check. Well, now what am I going to do? I'm going to have them record this into a Soundtrap project. Now, what do I do with Soundtrap? Soundtrap is a digital audio workstation that runs in a web browser. It's, it's really wild to think that we have this kind of technology. This is the kind of thing we don't typically think of being able to run in a web browser, but it does. You can create multi-track performances that are made up of loops in the loop library, audio recordings that you've recorded directly into your microphone. I've heard Soundtrap described as kind of like Google Docs and GarageBand sort of had a baby. That's the idea, is that it's running in a web browser and it's syncing all of your changes to a server, but the actual tool you're using is designed to do really similar things to GarageBand, which is make multi-track audio recordings. So this is often an app I use in my general music class to teach all sorts of things, the blues, music production, songwriting. What I'm using it for in band is to have students multi-track perform chamber music. And there's a couple of great ways you can do this. You can create a group in Soundtrap of students who are all contributing their individual part, or you can do what I do more often, which is to give one student the task of recording all of the different parts. And that is what this assignment here is. This is called the Six Note Blues. And what I've done is I have created a template, which is, has, it has three empty tracks. Now, when you're in Soundtrap, by the way, make sure that you turn off by default. There's this computer mic enhancer you want to have a clean sound on all of your microphones so that your students are not getting any unnecessary effects added to them. Now what I've done here is I provided three tracks for the student to record to. So they're going to record the one part, the two part, and the three part. They really like collaborating. They can all be inside of one of these projects at the same time. And then when you save your work and then someone else clicks the save button, whatever you did will show up on their screen. So you can have the kids rehearsing a trio with three of them in the same project or six of them doubling parts. And then they can actually be like kind of synchronously rehearsing. I mean, not real time, but like they can each lay down a part, play it back, hear what it sounds like with all three players in the same, you know, all locked in note by note. And then they can even chat with one another in the built-in chat area, which exists here in the right side of the screen. And they can provide feedback for one another. Now, like I said, I, I'm more often giving these as singular assignments. One, they're easier to integrate with Canvas. So I can assign everybody their own copy of this template. And when they open it, they will hear my, I got, I got a little practice track that plays. And so that's what the students hear and play along to. And what I did was I talked to the local, high, one of the local high schools has a Tri-M organization and the students are looking for service hours. So I got all of the students that I could to record all of the parts. So if you're one of my students and you're about to record, you can listen to a high school student play one, two, or all three of these parts in isolation or at the same time. So here's the horn. So the student is now hearing what they're supposed to sound like after they've recorded all three parts into the digital audio workstation. What's cool is if they're recording the one part, they can actually just toggle off everything except for the part they're about to play. So if I'm a horn player and I'm about to play 
I would just have this one thing I'm playing along to. Really helps them to hear the pitch. And so eventually what they get is a recording of themselves doing that. And again, I'm grading all of these in Canvas because of that integration that my school district is covering. When the kid is multi-tracking themselves multiple times, I've linked that to Canvas, like I said earlier. But what I do allow them to do since they like the group work so much is on some assignments, I'll say, okay, you have to record part one and part two, but you can invite a friend to record one or more of the other parts. And that seems to strike a healthy balance between keeping everything in the Canvas speed grader and then also allowing them to have fun recording with one another because that is adding tons of engagement that they wouldn't otherwise have. Okay, so I'm going to talk about Flipgrid the least. Flipgrid is, it's pretty straightforward. It's a video platform. I usually don't use Flipgrid unless I want it to be like a fun kind of secondary thing and, you know, just another way to get them to take their instrument out of their case. There are people who do varying degrees of this. I'll do things like posture check, like show me a deep breath was one of my first Flipgrid assignments. And, you know, it's on camera. So I'm like, we should be able to mute you and see physically that you are breathing. Like it, if you're just like, like that's not a breath. Like that's something that you can visibly see on camera if we mute you. So it's fun because the what Flipgrid adds is this sort of like interactive element to things where it looks like a social media feed where there's like a colorful circle around someone if they submitted a new video, much like an Instagram story. And this is just engaging for them because they can reply to each other's videos with other videos and they like it a lot. So I try to do fun, quick things like that. But then on the other end of it, I will use Flipgrid for final video performances where I'm giving them feedback on things that a computer cannot assess. So things like tone, intonation, posture. The feedback is key. You want the feedback to be really meaningful and specific to the kid and helping them achieve these things. You know, this is this is the part of it where it's like if they were in a class with me, like a class of seven trombones, and one of them kind of played like this, you know, I could really easily correct some postural things just with a verbal cue. While this process takes a lot longer through submitted video and feedback, it's still a really individual avenue to get to get very specific with students and help them to get to the next level. All right, so that was Develop Performance Skills Remotely with Cloud Software. I hope it was really useful to you. I'm going to cue the outro here in just a second. But again, please, please, please let me know if this was a useful format for you and how you're enjoying these solo episodes because I'm planning more of them for the summer. I'm Robbie Burns. Thanks for listening to Music Ed Tech Talk. You can find the show's page, show notes for the episode, and my blog at musicedtechtalk.com. You can subscribe to blog posts through an RSS app of your choice. And you can subscribe to the podcast and the podcast app of your choice. You can now get blog posts delivered right into your email inbox once a week. You only get an email if I actually post that week. Please rate and review this show in the Apple Podcasts app if you use it, or if you don't. It absolutely helps. Word of mouth is helpful too, so please spread the word about the show. You can learn more about my music and teaching career at RobbieBurns.com. I'm on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, Pinterest, all of the places at Robbie Burns. See you next time.